Wow, that's a lot of legs. friends, I'm Eric Brittingham, otherwise known as Mr. B from Wildlife on the Move, and welcome to Let's Go Wild. And today, it's all about a whole lot of legs. That's right. We're going to talk about critters that have a lot of legs. And let's start off with Chica right here. This is a curly-haired tarantula. She actually is found in uh, Nicaragua and Costa Rica. So she comes from South America. And she is an arachnid, not an insect. And we're going to talk about that because legs is the theme today. So if you notice, she actually has four legs on this side and four legs on that side. So eight total legs. That's what makes her an arachnid and not an insect. Now you might be saying, well, wait a minute, Mr. B, what about those two right there in the front? That actually makes it 10 legs. Well, those are actually called pedipalps, and those help her gather food. Now, she doesn't like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or pizza. She actually likes insects, spiders, scorpions, and crickets, things like that. So what she'll do is she actually uses her sense of touch and sense of feel. If you notice all those hairs all over her body, those are very sensitive to touch as well as uh, air movement. So when an animal comes hopping by like a cricket. They'll even touch these hairs, and these hairs are very sensitive to that touch, and she knows right away that it's lunchtime. When I'm touching her, you notice she's just moving her way. So she actually can tell the difference just by instinct what's food and what's not food. So once the hairs get touched by an animal that is a prey item, like a cricket, she's going to raise her body up. She's going to unfold her fangs, which are tucked right underneath here. They actually are black, shiny things. I don't know if we can see that real well on camera camera, but we'll try our best here to show you those. But they're black shiny things, and they're actually folded under her body. And so what she'll do is she'll stand up and she'll jump on top of that cricket. She'll unfold those fangs and stick them out like needles. Now, have you ever had a shot from a hospital or a doctor? I know it doesn't feel too good going in. Ouch! That doesn't feel too good to the cricket either. So she sticks those needle-like fangs into the cricket, and she is venomous. So I am holding a venomous animal right now. All spiders are venomous, even tarantulas. Now, they're not dead to people. They're deadly to those crickets, grasshoppers, spiders, and scorpions that we've been talking about. So what she does, she sticks those needle-like fangs in there. She injects venom into the insides of the cricket, turns the insides of the cricket to icky goo. Ew. Yeah, it starts digesting it from the inside out. So then she uses her fangs like you and I, when we drink those awesome chocolate vanilla or strawberry milkshakes using a straw, she does the same thing. She uses her fangs like straws and she... <laughs> slurps up that cricket shake. Sound pretty good? <laughs> I don't think your local ice cream shop is serving cricket shakes on your menu, so you don't have to worry about that. But she loves eating those things that way. So then those pedipalps, like I said, will help push that food item into those fangs. Now, the other cool thing is check that out she can actually hang upside down. Now she does that because she has little claws on the ends of her feet. They'll help her crawl, help her climb, help her hang upside down, but it also helps her with defense. So if you notice, she's got some bald patches right here on her hind end. This is actually called her abdomen. So that's one of her body parts. The other part right here is the cephalothorax. It's made up of the head and the chest together. So that's what makes this a spider and not an insect. Two body parts, eight legs. Now those bald spots, those come from her taking her hind legs when she gets scared or frightened, she can kick those hairs off her abdomen. And those hairs are like really irritating needles and almost like Velcro that's been cut up in a million pieces. It'll actually get on an animal's nose and in their eye, like coyotes love to come up here and smell these and eat these. They'll get that in their eye and on their nose, so they'll be scratching and she can actually walk away. And she can defend herself that way. And she doesn't even have to run because those hairs work so good. Now another thing that happens though on occasion though, coyotes will come along and they'll take one of these legs right off. And she can lose her legs. It's really silly to see a coyote with a little leg kicking of his mouth, but she just walks away and she's now down to seven legs. So in order to grow that leg back, she actually has to shed her skin. Very much like snakes shed their skin, uh, spiders do shed their skin as well. So she molts. Now she does have eight eyes. They're very small. Four on the front, four on the back, right here on top of her cephalothorax. There are little dots there that you can see, but she actually doesn't see very well at all. She picks up light and darkness and movement. And again, back to those hairs are very sensitive to touch and air movement. 
Now, another thing you might notice back here are these two little appendages right here. Those are help helping her with her spinnerets because they do spin silk. All right. She does spin silk, but she doesn't make a web at all. Big spiders like this do not need a web to catch their food. So what she'll do, she'll put out silk in front of her little burrow that she goes underground because they do like to live in holes in the ground. She'll put all those out there. They're like trip wires out there. And so when the animals come by, she knows that it's out there and she goes and she grabs it and she'll actually pounce on it and do all those things we talked about on how to eat it. Now, she also uses her silk to make a nice soft bed to sleep in, just like you and me like to have a nice soft mattress. Well, this animal actually likes to have a nice soft place to uh, sleep as well. She also will use her silk to wrap egg sacs for her babies. She can have 300 to 400 babies at a time. So that is an amazing thing. And then she also will use her silk to actually save her food for later. She wraps it up like saran wrap or a Ziploc bag or even foil. So she'll save that cricket for later and come back and eat it by wrapping it up. So an amazing eight-legged creature and a lot of legs there. So we're gonna go ahead and put Chica up and move on to another really cool place to talk about our next animal. We're gonna to go to Madagascar, which is near Africa. It's off the east coast of Africa. And I wanna show you this little animal right here in front. This is actually a Madagascan hissing cockroach. That's right. Now, this is not a tarantula or a spider at all. It is actually an insect because it has three legs on this side and three legs on that side. So it has six legs and it has one, two, three body parts. So it has a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, whereas that tarantula had the cephalothorax and abdomen. Now she also has a little antenna coming off here. They use those to smell with, and they do have eyes. They're very, very small, two on each side underneath their helmet there, but they actually smell with their antenna, and that's how they find their food. And these animals love to eat dead, decaying things, uh, all kinds of leaves and uh, all kinds of plants and animals that are dead and decaying. So they're nature's garbage cleanup crew of the forest. They're a recycler. Now, a lot of people will tell me, ooh, that's disgusting, it's a bug. And uh, we have a lot of myths about these guys that they're the most dirty, disgusting animal in the world. Well, think about that. Since they're nature's, nature's recyclers, they actually have to keep themselves clean so they don't get disease at all. And so what happens here is this little animal has saliva that has antibacterial products in it. So she cleans herself and actually makes them uh, clean from every time they eat something during disgusting, therefore they don't die. So the cockroach itself is not really dirty and disgusting at all. It's the stuff that comes out of the backside that we don't really want in our house that can cause, uh, you know, disease, bacteria, and things of that nature. But that stuff that comes out of the backside actually causes rich soil for our trees to grow and trees give us oxygen. So without the cockroach, the world would be a whole different place. But this little insect is very, very important to our world and is definitely nature's recyclers. Now, I want to show you another animal that has a lot of legs. Yeah, another cool critter with a whole lot of legs is this little desert millipede. This is Scooter, if I can get him unraveled here. He was really excited there for a while. He was walking around earlier on our log, but this is an animal that's awesome to talk about. This is not an insect. This is not an arachnid. It actually is an arthropod. So it has segmented body parts and kind of an exoskeleton. We didn't talk about that with the cockroach or the tarantula. Both of those have uh, exoskeletons as well. None of these animals have a backbone. They're actually invertebrates. So that means without a backbone. But you can notice as we're holding this little animal that it's got lots of legs. And that's the theme today, a lot of legs. And this is a millipede, so that actually means a thousand. Now, I don't think this millipede has quite a thousand legs, but they do have two legs per body segment, whereas your centipede is meaning a hundred, and that actually would be one leg per body segment on each side there, or one set of legs on each side. So this little animal is not venomous at all. It actually is an herbivore, so they eat lots of dead, decaying things as well, very similar to the cockroach, and they give us nice, rich soil. Now, you might notice some really weird, slimy stuff here on my fingers. That's actually a, a type of poison or a chemical property that actually is bitter tasting to some animals and can actually get them to drop this when they try to eat it. So it is putting a little bit of that out since it's a little afraid of me holding it right now. But you can see how it tucks up and, and rolls up like that, just like the one in 
front here. They're just kind of playing opossum or playing dead from some of our other episodes we talked about. And that helps protect them. When an animal's not moving, a lot of times uh, other animals don't suspect them or see them. And so that keeps them safe. Now this little animal, since uh, I'll try to unravel it here, we'll see if it will come around and show you the antenna, but they have antenna on the front of their head as well. So they smell with those and uh, they're able to find their food really well with that. Uh, they do have eyes. They don't see very well, however, but they do rely on those antenna. So another fascinating animal with a whole lot of legs. So we really appreciate you joining us for this portion of Let's Go Wild. And if you would, stay tuned for some messages from our wild supporters. And then right after that, we have a very special guest. Stay tuned. Let's Go Wild is brought to you by On Air Media, Happy Hawk Property Group, Mr. Longarm. Welcome back to Let's Go Wild, and now it's time for our wild side chat, and I am so excited to have our next guest. We go way back to the Dallas Zoo, and I can't wait to introduce you, so here he is. This is Ben Jones. He's with the Texas Conservation Alliance. Hey, Ben. Welcome. Hey, Eric. It's great to see you. And it's great to be here. I'm so glad to have you. So tell us more about the Texas Conservation Alliance and what you all do, what's your mission, and how people can get involved. I will. Well, the Texas Conservation Alliance, we go for T we go as TCA, TCA for short. Yep. And we've been around for 50 years. And that's amazing. I'm, and I'm really, so impressed with that. Yeah, me too. I've been around for 50 years. <laughs> yeah, so, me um, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we're focused on protecting Texas wildlife cool. and their habitats. A absolutely. That's yeah. our mission. That's awesome because, you know, as Wildlife on the Move, we talk a lot about Texas animals and yeah. try to promote their conservation as well as getting education out there because people misunderstand them. They and do. And sometimes when we think about wildlife, we think about, you know, animals around the world, which yeah. I love too. But a lot of times the animals that we share our yeah. state with are sometimes missed and forgotten. And they can. And be. they need our help. They definitely do. Well, so that segues nicely into some of the programs you all do. So tell us a little bit about your Lights Out program. I know about yeah. that one, and then we'll talk about another one. I will. Well, a lot of folks don't know about this. Thank you for, being, uh, for bringing it up. Yeah. It's called Lights Out for Wildlife. Yeah. Yeah, We've yeah. got a yard sign here yeah, I'll pick that. up and show everyone. Yeah, hold that with each other. <laughs> we, um, yeah, every spring and fall, millions, hundreds of millions, right. sometimes even estimated at billions of birds pour across Texas Absolutely. twice a year, yep. spring and fall migration. And yep. a lot of people don't realize it because they're about 5,000 feet up right? and it's at night. Exactly. Most birds migrate at night. So we don't Which see Which is it. amazing in itself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's an amazing feat. Yeah. And it's the most dangerous part of their lives. Of their lives, yeah. Yeah. They're traveling hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles right. across the continent. It's really mind blowing. Even a little hummingbird will fly 17 hours nonstop wow. over the Gulf of Mexico that twice a year. Daunting. <laughs> and out over the water, it's yeah. fly or die. Yeah, exactly. So it is something that's very full of threats sure. to birds. Again, the most dangerous part of their life. Most people don't realize that light, artificial light on mm -hmm. the ground is super attracting to birds. It okay. confuses them okay. and it attracts them. We think sometimes, well, if they see light, they'll avoid it. No, no they it's go the other way it. around. Okay. They fly to it. Almost like kind of being mesmerized, we think. Really? They fly down high out of their elevations, down towards brightly lit homes and buildings. Okay. And a lot of times, unfortunately, they collide with the building. And which we're seeing ends a lot of death. that. You guys are seeing that That's downtown right. a lot because we've we got see high rise downtown. buildings and a lot of lit right. up buildings there. They're beautiful. Don't get me wrong. They but are. But they can cause some havoc for our birds. For exactly. Sure. And uh, people don't realize it, but the simple action for this is just turning off all non essential lighting cool. from 11 p.m until 6 a.m. the next morning. And that's an easy thing for anybody. Exactly, to do. just the flip of a switch could save thousands, thousands of, birds of lives. birds' lives nice. and we really need help. Collisions with buildings is the number 2 cause of right. bird deaths in North America. Wow. Uh, just behind feral cats. So, we lose, it's hard to believe and it's heavy, but up to 1 billion birds every single year just colliding with buildings wow. and it's not just downtown buildings, it's also residential, residential areas, buildings. homes. Okay. So yeah. flipping those switches, turning off light that's non-essential from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. 
is a really powerful thing we can all, all do, do to make a difference to save birds absolutely to well, save we birds had, lives we had one of our buddies on that you know Tim Bryce yeah. and he was talking about he's with the Perot Museum and yeah. they're helping you all exactly out it's a with big collaboration yeah. yeah and working with Texas A&M that's University right. as well so that's something you all out there can get involved with right Ben you that's need absolutely volunteers right to help out with the there's surveys a whole bunch as well of people collections. involved Texan by nature Texas A&M like you mentioned the sure. Perot Museum the Audubon Centers we're asking people to come together to take so, action. Right to close blinds, to close uh, drapes, to stop as the much light. light coming out right. of the house as possible. And also maybe join us on some downtown surveys, 6 to 8 a.m. It's bright and early. <laughs> it's an early morning. But we love to have people join That'd in. That'd be great. So that's an excellent way to be a wild child and make a difference. Awesome. Join us. Cool. Well, let's talk about another program uh, that you all are involved with that I'm fascinated by. So tell us a little bit about uh, gardening for wildlife. You bet. All right. Right. Well, our again, our organization, TCA, is focused on restoring habitat for uh, wildlife, restoring awesome. their homes. Because that's what's being lost. That's that's right. An alarming rate, the loss right? and degradation of habitat are the number yeah. one threat to wildlife, to wildlife. today. Okay. That's right. So we can all take action to restore those homes. So even the night sky is habitat for right. birds, and Absolutely. we don't think of it that way. Yeah. And then, of course, our yards, our homes, our areas around um, our schools, our churches, our campuses, Very everything good. can be restored for wildlife. And we all know the elements of habitat, right? So do you Water. guys come along with an organization to help them figure out Absolutely. what needs to go back into to an area to make it more natural you or bet. native plants and things of that nature? We or? just did a big prairie restoration awesome. with Coppell High School, which was really <laughs> exciting. Cool. So we just took some of that uh, lawn and, and restored it or rewilded it back to prairie. <laughs> there you go. And that is the elements of habitat, right? They need animals need just like us water. Yeah. They need shelter. They need food Absolutely. and they need space. So when we bring those native plants through gardening for wildlife back into our yards, yeah. back onto school campuses Absolutely. and places like that, it brings those food elements, those shelter elements, bits of, you know, even water, water we can yep. create. We bring wildlife back, back into our them. neighborhoods, yeah, back into I, our yards. And I think we we think everything's so disconnected. I get it a lot where people are just shocked in our area, DFW, that there's coyotes around. Yeah, that's right. There's alligators out that's there it. in the rivers and the lakes. But we have to have them yeah. because we're all connected. And if we take the little bits of those chains, of, uh, links of those chains out, that's right. it causes havoc for us too. That's and we just exactly don't even right. realize it. That's so right. It's an excellent thing that you're doing. So let's uh, segue into, you know, tell us a little bit about your, your journey. You know, as a child, yeah. what, what got you interested in working with wildlife, whether it be at the zoo or now yeah. working with TCA and conservation? What, what sparked your interest? And in, uh, what would you tell somebody out there, whether it be a kid or an adult, of what they should do to kind of yep. pursue your path? Well, thanks, Eric, for asking. <laughs> sure. You know, I've thought about it some, and I think um, it's hard to know exactly, you know, what puts you on this path. Yeah. I think I was just born this way. <laughs> like many okay. of the wild childs out there, yeah, you know, I bet you like probably that, right? think I just was born loving animals yeah. and wildlife. Yeah. I've been fascinated uh, by them from the very beginning. Cool. I even just through my conversations and everything, remember my grandmother telling me she pulled me aside when I was seven and she said, you know what they call people like us? And I just thought, <laughs> oh boy, we're called something. What you know, they say, yep. They, she said, they call us naturalists. There you go. And so, you know, everything from Ranger Rick to a Mutual of Omaha's Wild. Remember all the oh, great I, TV I shows? Sunday and night, right? Like the kids are watching now, all the great National Geographic yeah, and absolutely. everything like that. I was right there, you know, watching That's every what single one of you them. And pulled you in. Right. right. And it yeah. kept teaching me. And I guess, um, for people and young people, especially who are interested in this work, I'd say just learn as much as you can, okay. keep learning, watch shows like this, get tips on how you can help, and then step forward and take action take for action, wildlife. Right. We need as many people so, as we can. So with TCA, are there opportunities to volunteer oh, yeah. for kids on up to adults? You bet. Okay. We, so we don't great, have great any age limits. All ages are welcome. Awesome. All ages. So We'll tell you more on how to get involved with that. Absolutely. We'd love to have you. Cool. And well, we've got events going all year long. We just go to our website and check them out and then awesome. click RS, uh, the RSVP link and we'll see you there. That'd be great. Well, tell us some things about, I think you brought some items to yeah, show you people, you know, what happens out there when, you know, human elements get yeah. introduced or we're not doing our part as a wild child to make a difference for wildlife so that they can survive. So let's pull some of those out. You we'll bet. talk about you them bet. and I'll ask some questions as we go. Well, like we mentioned, the loss and degradation of wildlife habitats, the number one threat to wildlife sure. today. So 
TCA is trying to restore that habitat, not only the night sky and not only our yards for yeah. wildlife, through garden for wildlife, but also our waterways, our rivers, our creeks, storm our, drains, our, our, our cities, oceans. the ocean. Right, Absolutely. The oceans, yeah. Here we are in the Dallas area and we're in the Trinity River watershed. Yeah. And so what people sometimes don't know is that all the water that hits our area, it's like the bottom of a shower. It all eventually Ooh. ends up down in our Trinity River. There you go. 700 miles later, twisting and turning across the state of Texas. All the way down to the Gulf. All the way into the Gulf. All rivers lead to the ocean. That's right. And you hear a lot in the media about the plastic pollution issues in the ocean. Absolutely. And sometimes we think, oh, that's oh, going yeah. off of boats right. or maybe cruise it's ships. It's not me. I'm not having exactly. an impact. Yeah. More than 80% of all that litter pollution is coming from right. the land, from cities like ours, right. being washed by rain down into storm drains, and all that eventually ends up in the sea. Right. I brought some plastics here. Okay. I don't know about the most interesting things to look at, but I think they <laughs> yeah, are. But, yeah, you they've know, got a story for sure. Oh, yeah. look at that. Here's a plastic bottle. Let's see. Here's another flip flop. And if you look closely, you'll see little bites Bite marks. taken yeah. out of these plastic and elements this is that? all litter pollution it's not my dog at home my dog <laughs> exactly. does that to my flip-flop but i think that was marine <laughs> life right exactly now what's happening here is unfortunately these little bites that okay. you see that look like little diamonds or triangles those are from sea turtles sea turtles, sea turtles are mistaken that. they're mistaking these objects for their food, food right. sometimes their favorite food, which we know is jellyfish. Right, and, and you can imagine kind of that floating, that, floating on the around. waves, yeah. right? Absolutely. Just like a jellyfish and a sea turtle comes up, and when they bite this plastic, they ingest, ingest it. it, and then sometimes it, it can away. be really bad. It can impact them, and they that's can exactly die right. Yeah, okay. So when we pull litter pollution out of the environment. In a way, it's like clearing a minefield, yeah. potential minefield for sea turtles and other wildlife. Absolutely. So we do these big river cleanups and creek cleanups, and we'd love to have people join in that on that. Be another way to be a wild child. And Absolutely. And just right there where you are in your own neighborhood, you know, when you get out of the car and go into the store and you see a plastic bottle Pick laying there, up. if nobody picks that up, yeah. It's washed into the storm right, drains right. into the river. You remember when we were at the the zoo, I had a, a phrase for our volunteers because Ben actually was head of the volunteer program. And I always tell him, if you pass it, you trash it. That's right. That's what we kind of talked That's about. Exactly but now, nowadays, right. you want to recycle it, right? That's so right. That'd be great. Um, so it sounds like, since our theme today was a lot of legs, it sounds like you need a lot of legs on the ground. Oh, man. To make that a is difference. the perfect way to put it. We need so <laughs> many legs on the ground to help turn this around for wildlife. Yeah. As many people get involved, will become part of the greatest wildlife comeback story in American, in American history. history. We yeah. can do it. And that'd be great having TCA heading that charge, and we appreciate you doing that. Well, let's talk about a few other two personal things, and then we'll ask you, you a little bit more about how people can help out. So uh, tell me about a wild, crazy time working with wildlife, yeah. you know, something funny or something really crazy that you have, whether working with animals or doing some of this work with TCA. Yeah. You can tell me, just give me one example, because people always love hearing about our tall Tales out there you know, I hate to through. admit this. Yeah. Okay. I've always been a huge spider fan. I awesome. love spiders, well, especially that's what we tarantulas. Had on earlier, so. Awesome. Yeah, we had a tarantula. is one of my on. favorite animals. Yeah. But I got to admit, maybe some of you out there are the same way. I'm a little nervous around snakes. Okay. And I'm a wildlife guy. Right. So I don't really want that to be too, you know. No. No, exactly. <laughs> but when, I mean, when I got to the zoo, one of the first things they asked nice. me to do was to care for our education animal collection. And that included Good. a lot, of, a lot snakes. of snakes. Yeah. So there I was on day two. They open up, you know, this uh, habitat yep. with this big boa constrictor in it, oh, which now I really love. Yeah. But I just have to admit, you know, then my heart was racing. Sure. I was kind of out of breath. Yeah. And the education grabbed the snake and brought it out and handed it to and me. What do you do? If you've and I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, just step forward yeah. and do it. Yeah. You know, since then, um, you know, I've just, my respect for those animals has grown so significantly, but back then but that, it's good to remember. Right. That's a good you know, impact story. You grow in your career yeah. and you grow in your understanding. And, um, well, and so know, that was kind of crazy. That is, well, you know, we are the snake guys, wildlife on the move. And so that's what I see a lot. Yeah. You know, the kids are really excited about yeah. it but it's the adults that we've already got things in our that's head right. that were put there and to unravel that it takes baby steps so that's, that's right. a cool story you shared yeah. so i always tell everybody you know you only fear what you don't understand that's so right the more you learn the less you fear and so that kind of ties with all that you're sharing with our, our our points that we need to make yeah. with conservation and how we can help um another question oh you kind of alluded to you like tarantulas so i love asking this question if you could be any animal at all ben oh, man. Who, what would it be and why 
<laughs> oh, if I could be any animal yeah. at all. You know, I am such a fan of so much wildlife, from uh, elephants too. to penguins to tarantulas to birds of all kinds. I'm crazy for birds. Bird, yeah. But you, you know what I have birds. to say? Every day when my little weenie dog <laughs> crawls into my lap and I get to watch him play and and I love how he, you know, is bonded to me. I have to go with the canids. Okay. Any so of the like dogs. Canines. Any dogs, of the dogs. Wolves, I love coyotes. wolves. Yeah. America's most, well, the rarest wolf in the world, the go. red wolf, red wolf is yeah. one of my favorite animals. So I just would say broadly, I really canids. love canids. So you, you I love the canines, the canines, wolves, foxes, and what, even you know, our on and on and on. Common dog. And even coyotes <laughs> and the common dog, even the weenie dog. There you go. Is uh, I'm a big fan. That's great. That sounds <laughs> awesome. Yeah, if I'm in the mammal world, for me, it's opossums. Oh, yeah. I think they're Love so amazing. And, and what a great uh, environmentalist that opossum is. You That's know, they right. do a lot for our environment and people forget that. Well, you know, I could talk with you forever. Yep, we could probably here. share so many stories because <laughs> we go so far back. Let's just hang this out. Is, yeah, let's just hang out. We'll keep doing it. <laughs> but we appreciate you being here. We appreciate what Texas Conservation you, Alliance Eric. does. So tell our viewers then, Ben, yep. uh, what can they do to uh, help uh, be a wild child and make a difference for our world by helping out Texas Conservation Alliance? Where should they go? You and got how it. can they get plugged in? Well, everybody can make a difference. Just like you're saying, everybody can and save wildlife and there's a role for all of us to be involved with texas conservation alliance the easiest thing to do is just check out our website at tcatexas.org tcatexas.org you can you can sign up for a wildlife restoration event awesome you can check out all the projects we've got going you can read a little bit more about wildlife and what's going on we've got a piece out now on bobcats oh, cool. and mountain lions and so um, just check out the website. That's where you can learn how to get involved. Okay. We'd love to see you on That'd the ground restoring homes for yeah, wildlife. We need, we need a lot of legs out there to make a difference and be a wild child. Right. And we'll have more information about that coming up next. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for joining us today. And from all of us at Wildlife on the Move, let's go wild again sometime. And in the meantime, be a wild child and support our animal care fund like Chica and all her legged friends as well as my special guest and our world. If you go to bonfire.com slash store slash wild dash where, we'll have information for how you can do that and support our animal care fund. We'll see you soon. Be a wild child and support the Texas Conservation Alliance by visiting their website at www.tcatexas.org and follow them on Facebook at TCA Texas. Donate to our animal care fund at mygivingcircle.org slash charity slash wildlife on the move. Check out our website and book our programming at www.wildlifeonthemove.com. Follow us on Facebook at Live Animal Shows. Follow us on Twitter at Mr. B underscore W-O-T-M. Follow us on Instagram at eric.wildlifeonthemove. And check out our YouTube channel and subscribe to this very program at Let's Go Wild. Subscribe to Patreon for monthly animal adventure videos at patreon.com slash animal adventures.